Wow, did you see that Mark Dever video, Scorched Earth, nuking the Presbyterians out of orbit? I guess uh, Mark Dever speaking at a recent Nine Marks conference or something like that. Maybe it was some other kind of conference or regional get-together. Uh, he put together six wild claims in just under two minutes. And I got to tell you, uh, as a Presbyterian, I loved it. I thought it was wild. I thought it was fantastic. The crowd loved it, too. The crowd was laughing. I couldn't quite tell if they were laughing with Mark Dever or whether they were laughing at Mark Dever. Some of the things that he was saying were obviously a little bit outrageous from the perspective, of course, of a reformed Presbyterian. But man, I got to tell you, I loved it. Two minutes of unhinged Presby versus Baptist battle, uh, mostly Baptist versus Presby battle, I, I guess we should say, because Mark Dever was on full flamethrower mode, taking on such topics as pedo baptism and Presbyterian ecclesiology, all in under two minutes, just over two minutes. Uh, I got to tell you, my first reaction, I thought it was fun. I thought it was interesting. I love people that speak with a little bit of conviction, so it didn't bother me at all. Obviously, people like me are right in the target of who Mark Dever was challenging in that particular moment. I didn't really get a good look either at who else was on stage. It looked to me like it was one of those uh, kind of Q&A type scenarios where he's sitting with a few other people. Some of their faces looked like they were white as a ghost um, reacting to what Mark Dever was claiming here in this clip. And again, I didn't see the full context of this. I saw what most people saw, which is a just over two minute clip on Twitter. Interestingly, though, um, it's already coming down from a lot of tweets. I'm not sure if it was the negative visceral reaction of like, whoa, are you really going to make that claim that maybe caused somebody to pull the, the tweet or the video down? It's still up on Twitter, though. You can do a search for it. Just search for like Mark Dever nukes Presby's or something like that. I don't know what to put in there. But uh, I do want to give just a little bit of a reaction to it here. Obviously, I would totally disagree with practically everything that he said in that particular clip. So let's start off with the fact that he claims that pedo baptist Protestants have a wrong view of regeneration. Well, um, some do, we should say. And we should distinguish ourselves as Presbyterians from the regenerative baptismal views of others like the Lutherans, for instance, um, who do actually hold the baptismal regeneration. Of course, at the very beginning of the clip, he's making the point that Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox theologians and churches do hold the baptismal regeneration. What's interesting, though, to me, is how he seems to conflate Lutheran baptismal regenerative views with Presbyterian views. And he initially starts off talking about pedo baptist Protestants, kind of wide wide-angle attack there against anybody who would be pedo baptistic whether Presbyterian, Anglican, Lutheran, or what have you. But then he almost immediately switches to talking at or to Presbyterians, which led me to wonder whether or not he might be conflating the views of the Lutherans and the Presbyterians together as though Presbyterians believe in baptismal regeneration, which in fact we do not. And in um, counter-argument to his presupposition that pedo baptistic Protestants have a false understanding of what regeneration is, I would merely uh, submit for consideration our actual confessional documents on that very topic. So I would suggest that persons like Mark Dever might reread, if they haven't read it recently, the Westminster Confession of Faith and what it has to say on regeneration. Specifically, chapter 10 on effectual call, chapter 14 on saving faith, chapter 15 on repentance unto life. We could do the same thing with the Heidelberg Catechism, but nowhere in the Reformed Confessions um, will you find something stated as the Lutherans would about the potency of baptismal regeneration. That's just not a position that we hold. And so I understand sometimes when you're in these moments, you tend to conflate ideas. It started to sound to me like he, in that moment, just confused Lutheran views on baptismal regeneration with Presbyterian views on regeneration. We do not hold to baptismal regeneration. We hold that baptism is a covenantal sign and seal, and so that's a little bit different there. Interestingly, um, I don't think you can really find a lot of fault, though, with his main first wild claim, which is that paedo baptistic Protestants have a false or bad or 
somehow incomplete understanding of regeneration, especially when you look at what we actually hold to in those Reformed confessions that I just quoted here. So I think we can kind of just dismiss that first claim out of hand as either a conflation on his part or perhaps an overgeneralization that is certainly not helpful, especially on the Reformed, Confessional, Westminsterian, or Heidelbergian understandings of regeneration. So we'll just set that aside. I did look up his church, by the way, to see what confessional standard they hold to. I thought that it might have been the 1689 Baptist Confession, but it looked to me like they had one of those just kind of short, pithy, what we believe type statements on their website, which... You know, if we're going to argue that one understanding, one theology, one doctoral statement is more robust than the other, I would certainly put my weight in the Westminster Confession of Faith rather than just kind of one of those quick 20-point what we believe type statements, very thin and skeletal as it is on his uh, capital Baptist Church doctrinal website. So I'm not sure if he subscribes to something more confessional than that, but certainly his first claim is either a conflation or else totally wrong. Now, the second thing he says is very interesting. And again, I, I just think this is all almost all rhetorical device rather than anything else. But he says that, and this is a quote here, the crazy people in the room are you guys who are saying there's a church full of unregenerate people talking at Presbyterians here in this this moment, as far as I understand his quotes. And again, it's a little bit unhinged, a little bit just kind of extemporaneous, um, intemperate a bit. But again, I loved it. I thought it was great. I'm not complaining about the tone or anything like that. I thought it was fun. Um do Presbyterians hold to a church of unregenerate people, though? I don't think that's really what we believe. Um, now, we don't believe that baptism of infants regenerates, but that doesn't mean either that we believe in a church, quote, full of unregenerate people, unquote. Uh, actually, to the contrary, we believe that the church is filled with regenerate people. But we do have a distinction, don't we, between the visible church and the invisible church. And as far as we understand what the church is, at least in this world, in this life, um, there will always be some unregenerate people who participate in the visible church. And that's part of the problem is nobody can truly look into the heart of another person and see whether or not they're actually regenerate. Now, I understand from their perspective that it seems a very good thing to only baptize and receive into membership those people who make a profession of faith in Christ. But I think we all recognize that there are false professors. There are people who with their mouths say all the right things about professing faith in Jesus, and then later they apostatize. And by that, we don't mean that they lost their salvation, but what we do mean is that they made a false claim towards salvation in the first place, uh, similar to the parable of the sower in the Gospel of Mark and in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, there are those who appear to spring up in faith, but because of the thorns or the rocks, they fall away and apostatize. And that's true whether you're Baptist or Presbyterian. And so as it turns out, Having a particular mode or theology of baptism does not guard you 100% with certainty that you're not going to have some unregenerate people in your church. But I do think that Mark Dever here does misunderstand part of what we do as Presbyterians. Now, just to um, maybe explain a little bit about what we actually hold regarding membership, in our Book of Order, for instance, we have a category of baptized members. And yes, that would include little ones, our children. We do baptize children not to save them, but in hopes that they might be saved, because for us, baptism is a sign and seal of the covenant of grace. And as such, it is God's promise that he will save those who trust in Jesus Christ. And so we do look forward to the days that our little ones will make profession of faith and come to the table. But see, um, maybe he doesn't know this or might have slipped his mind in the moment, but we also have a category of communicant membership, too. So we baptize our children and we consider them participants in the body of Christ, just like in the Old Testament. Uh, young ones came to the solemn assemblies. They were expected to be there with their parents. In fact, there's a number of Old Testament texts that specifically require children, even the youngest ones, even nursing children, to be present with the people of God. But um, for communicant membership, we do have young people come to profess their faith to the elders at some point. And so with the idea of full church membership or communicant membership, um, whether a person is uh, a young person or a teen or an adult, they still must come to the elders to profess profess their faith in Jesus, to give a testimony of their understanding of God's saving work in their lives. And of course, they take their vows before the congregation at that point then to 
uh, basically give an oath that they do believe in Christ and to uh, swear its fealty to him alone and participation in the life of the church. And so um, this is either, you know, well, it's probably just probably just a gross misrepresentation of what Presbyterians believe. We're not out there making the claim that the church is, quote, full of unregenerate people, but rather we have a realistic view that the church has regenerate people and probably, unfortunately, some who make a profession of faith with the mouth but have not been savingly wrought upon in the heart. And so that's probably just a little bit of a, of a <clears throat> clarification there. And again, even a Baptistic position does not guarantee that all who are baptized are certainly saved or that they're definitely regenerate. I think that would be claiming too much for the baptismal position. Third, and again, um, in this two-minute wild clip here, he gets a little bit, uh, a little bit cantankerous, a little bit irritable. He says something to the fact that you talking to Presbyterians are the crazy people in the room. I, I think most of this was directed towards Presbyterians. Again, maybe he has Lutherans and Anglicans in mind too. But he starts to indicate that perhaps a, a little bit of personal vitriol here. He says something to the effect of, you guys are smarter than us. A little bit snarky there, but again, I loved it. No skin off my back. I thought it was fun. He says he's tired of getting condescended to all the time. And then he makes the claim that you don't understand what you claim to very well at all. Now, at this point, the audience was really loving it. They were laughing. Mark Dever was the only person who was not laughing in that moment, though I think he too kind of sensed that there was a little bit of a humorous anecdote happening. And that's why he goes on to make some joke about uh, coming to the the altar as we sing just as I am or something like that, like that. Honestly, I thought that was probably the least persuasive part of Dever's overall um, brief <laughs> tirade or rant, whatever we want to call it. Um, those kinds of arguments I find to be very unconvincing just as such. So let's move then to the next thing that he says. And he talks a little bit about liberal drift. Um, he makes a claim that we, speaking to the Baptists, have a church from the 1770s that's still faithful preaching the gospel. The audience seemed to get that reference, but it went over my head. I'm not exactly sure what he's talking about there, but but that's great. Um, churches that are faithful after hundreds of years of extant preaching and teaching and administering of the sacraments, I mean, we celebrate that, that just as you would. I, I would say awesome, and I'm all the more thankful for it. I would also submit um, that antiquity alone doesn't mean faithfulness, and so a church that was planted last Wednesday is still just as thrilling to me as a church that's been around for a couple hundred years. But I, I get the point that long, longevity, a longitudinal ministry faithful over the decades and the generations is in fact a beautiful thing. I would only argue back that we have that too. And so I don't think that it's necessarily credo-baptism or congregationalism as such that ensures that churches will be faithful over the generations and indeed the centuries. Because just as he can point to churches that have been faithful for hundreds of years, so also can we. In fact, I could point to the one just down the road, Middlesex PCA, not far from us, a couple miles away. Uh, they built their building, I think their first one in 1790. Okay, so... I mean, we can do that too, and that's why this argument doesn't hold a lot of water for me. It makes me wonder whether or not Mark Dever has heard of denominations like the RPCNA, one of the most faithful, reformed, uh, Presbyterian, covenantal, solid, orthodox, confessional denominations that there is. I mean, these guys have been around for generations uh, too. Same thing with the ARP, the Covenanters here, uh, a, a long strong, faithful succession of Reformed, pedo baptistic and Presbyterial, ecclesiological uh, churches. I think that's fantastic. So you have that evidence, so do we. I don't think that one proves um, that it's any better than the other. And then he takes a shot at the low-hanging fruit here. He says, you guys, you PCUSA Presbyterians and you uh, Episcopal Church people, look at you, you, you guys are the liberals, and the implication is that uh, we're liberal because of paedo-baptism or because of our Presbyterian polity, which again, I just found that all too easy to dismiss because we could simply do the same thing and point to liberal Baptistic churches like the American Baptist Church, for instance, which is 
about as liberal as the PCUSA or the ECUSA. They too have their same issues with wokeism and secularism and progressive creep and all that kind of thing. And not only that, but um, one of his main points here at this point in the uh, the two minute viral clip is that baptism for uh, credo baptism prevents liberal slide or progressive slide, and it maintains a church in its confessional and conservative, well, maybe not confessional, but at least it's conservative orientation. Um, again, I would say simply this, that just because a church is baptistic and congregational, it certainly does not mean that it's going to protect its conservatism over time, because we could point to the counter evidence of the Unitarians and the mega churches and the Evangelifish churches, and maybe they'll say they're not Baptist, we're non-denominational or whatever, but they actually are baptistic in practice and in their ecclesiology. So even as he points to the easy, I mean, it's too easy, right? It's just a straw man to point to the PCUSA or something like that and see, see what happens to Pado Baptist. Well, we can do the same thing and point back, and I don't think that really wins a lot of points. Then he um, takes a shot at presbyteries and bishops. And again, it made me wonder, uh, he seems to be addressing Presbyterians, but kind of conflates a Lutheran ecclesiology with a Presbyterian ecclesiology. We Presbyterians don't have bishops, and I'm sure he knows that, uh, but he doesn't think that that's any sort of safeguard against liberal progressivism, and I would say, actually, I do think it is, um, because the point of a presbytery is to be able to hold ministers accountable. So he thinks a better form of accountability would be having every member vote in terms of a congregational ecclesiology. But uh, we actually think that we do something quite biblical by organizing according to presbyteries. And if you don't think that presbyteries are scriptural, I would simply suggest that the Galatians, plural, are actually a presbytery. So also the churches in Revelation in chapters 1 and 2, right? The churches of Asia Minor, that was a presbytery. Book of Revelation is written to a presbytery. Uh, Acts chapter 15 operates almost exclusively on presbyterian principles of representative a delegation to an assembly, and that's exactly what they do, is they propound a particularly difficult problem, and they discern the difference between truth and falsehood, between right teaching and false teaching in Acts chapter 15. And so um, now whether or not we've applied it consistently over the years, obviously we've failed because there are progressive denominations and churches within the Presbyterian systems. Uh, it's not an entirely uh, fail-proof safeguard against liberal drift, but then again, neither is credo-baptism or congregational vote. I don't really see the point there either. He seems to suggest that if we really want to protect the gospel, and this is probably the most inflammatory clip, that we should get rid of infant baptism and be congregational in form. I wondered why he tied those two together. Um, if you want to protect the gospel, get rid of infant baptism and be congregational. Interesting that both of those are sort of individualistic expressions of Christianity. Um, getting rid of infant baptism then in some ways takes away from its covenantal or corporate aspect. It makes it an individualistic experience, which is why so many Baptists, especially those in non-denominational churches, they really make their baptism their sort of me and JC moments about me testifying upwardly that I belong to him. Um, in credo Baptist practice, baptism is essentially a person promising fidelity to God upwardly, I, I promise I'll serve you and love you. But we actually see it more of a downward promise, the promises of God and the gospel to the covenant people of God. And not only that, but congregationalism is, of course, also an individualistic experiential form of ecclesiology, because basically what it says is we don't get along with anybody. <laughs> and I'm not sure that that really protects the gospel in any particular way. Um, saying that everyone else is progressive and secular and liberal compared to us, we're the one true church. In fact, we can't even agree to a be in covenant uh, bonds with any other church. Uh, to me, that doesn't really bespeak much of the gospel. But in fact, I think what, um, what Pado baptism and Presbyterial form does is actually gives a very clear picture of the gospel, especially, and this will be controversial, even infant baptism, because what is infant baptism other than a person who's totally undeserving of, of grace experiencing 
the promises of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. That it, That is the gospel, right? The gospel is that you don't deserve anything because of your works, your, your abilities, your merits, your standing, your background, anything. You come to God by grace alone, through faith alone. And so there's a beautiful picture of that in the infant who can't do anything to save himself. That's why it's, it's so beautiful, right? And we tend to pour because uh, the Bible does make a connection between baptism of water and baptism with the Spirit. And when spirit baptism is discussed, very often it's talked about as the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. So even in the mode there, there's something to it. I also think that infant baptism points to the work of Christ in a very unique and beautiful way because of its correspondence with circumcision, which I think is lost in these more experiential me and JC kind of moments of self-dedication that we see in credo baptism. Um, infant baptism is a picture of what God has done for us in Christ, and that corresponds with um, circumcision. So uh, Paul says that circumcision was a sign of faith in the book of Romans chapter 4, and so also infant baptism is a sign of faith, even though the infant may not yet believe. Uh, we trust and pray that one day he or she will believe, but more to the point, just as circumcision pointed forward to the one, that is Christ, who is going to bleed and die and be cut off for the sake of the people, that was the point of circumcision, right? To point to the Messiah, what he was going to do for us by uh, saving us through his blood. So also baptism points back to that same work of Jesus Christ and washing us of our, of our sins. And again, we don't claim that this regenerates the infant, but what we do claim is that this is a beautiful picture, a depiction of the gospel of Jesus. As we look at the infant being baptized into the covenant community of faithful believers, we look at the fact that by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, Jesus takes sinners like us and he brings us into the corporate family of the people of God. And so if we're going to say that one depicts the gospel better than the other, you know, there's a pretty strong argument that infant baptism is a beautiful picture of the gospel. All right. So um, overall, I thought it was fun. It was great. I loved it. Totally disagree with most of his major claims there. But uh, that's kind of the beauty of being in the body of Christ is that we can argue with each other, sometimes even vociferously. All right. Thanks for checking into this particular video. By the way, if you like my cool shirt, my Reed Fahrenheit 451 shirt, it's part of my summer dystopia series of t-shirts. You can get those in the link in the description of this video made by my friends, Chad and Shauna at Cassidy Craft Corner. Their t-shirts are cool. All right. Love you guys. Thanks for checking in. Talk to you later.